Welcome family and friends to our 130th anniversary celebration, but also the third week of our series, A Generous Christmas. Over the last couple weeks, we've been talking about what it means to live in the true gifts of Christmas, the kind that you can't put under a tree. But if you remember last week, I told you a little story about how one of my Christmases, roughly 1993, I was hoping for a very specific gift. And my mother had gotten it for me, but she didn't put it under the tree because she wanted to surprise me, right? And if you remember my reaction to that final gift, it was like a sweater or something. I said, ah! I threw a big fit, right? Right in the middle of the room, right in front of all of my family. Now, I would love to stand here and tell you that was an isolated incident in my childhood, but wait, there's more. Because you see, around a year later, something similar happened. My birthday starts the 12 days of Christmas, so I know it was at least a year later, and the Super Nintendo once again prominently plays into this story, but it was my birthday, and I had a bunch of friends over, and we had a lot of fun. You know, in the middle of December in Wyoming, we were going to go outside and hit a pinata, and, and then we figured out, you know what, it's December in Wyoming, and unlike Denver, even though we're only four hours away, there's this huge difference in the snow that happens, right? So we had my birthday pinata bashing party inside in the living room, and in this small little space, there was a circle of like 20 kids, and they gave me a weapon and a blindfold. Do you see where this is going yet? Yeah, it gets good. So they handed me, it wasn't a baseball bat, but it was something like a, a tube, you know, a thick tube of some kind, and I remember they put that blindfold on me, and they spun me around, and I... Got my gears going. I was like, all right, the pinata's right there, right? So I took a big old swing, and I felt boom, thud. I was like, I got that thing. I clobbered that pinata. But then I lifted up my blindfold to see Coulter Anderson going, Yow! I had clobbered one of my friends. And for some odd reason, after that event, we hardly spoke to each other all through junior high, elementary school, high school. It was like, for some reason, there was like this animosity between us. But the real meat of the story happened shortly after that. After I opened all four Ninja Turtle action figures that I'd been wanting, one of the gifts was Street Fighter II for the Super Nintendo. I don't remember which version it was because they made like 17 of them, but I remember getting that game and going downstairs with my friends and we played a tournament against each other and I was winning. I was Blanca, this little green troll thing that fights, right? And I was just about to finish off the last friend when my mom came downstairs and said, Lee, your uncle's here. He was at work and he has another gift for you. Well, if you're a little boy, a little kid, and someone says, hey, by the way, there are more presents, you're like, all right, this is the greatest day ever, right? So I went upstairs, and my mom and my uncle were there, and, and she, uh, he handed me that, that gift that he had gotten, and I, I opened it up, and you're going to see a pattern here. It was closed. And I looked up, and I looked back at the present, and I went... Can I go back downstairs now? I was really doing good at that Super Nintendo game. And I started to walk away, right? So my mother had to come over to me and said, Lee, you hurt your uncle's feelings and, and stuff like that. I was like, oh, really? How? Why? Uh, can I go play Super Nintendo? You know, it was just that pattern of self-centeredness. Well, they always say you get your comeuppance, right? So... Last Saturday, if you were here at the women's Christmas tea, you probably at some point, if you were here early enough, heard this sounding of carols that sounded a little bit more like shrieks and, and crying, right? Well, my, my son Logan was told to do something or not to do something. I'm not sure which side of the story this lands on. But either way, that caused a 1993 no Super Nintendo under the tree moment in my son's life. And he began to scream and throw a fit. And my, my poor wife pulled him into another room. I was upstairs working in my office. I heard the commotion, went downstairs. And by the time I had gone down there, I opened the door and I just saw this. Like, whoa, okay, all right. I'm going to step out here and let things happen. Uh, have a good day, guys. And uh, 
My, my son got a little bit of a talking to. My poor wife, who is usually serving downstairs, she doesn't get a chance to be up and just be around the church family much, then had to pull herself away to make sure Logan didn't have another one of those moments. And I started to recognize something from my own childhood in my son in that moment. It was something I didn't want to see. You see, we want to pass down the idealized version of ourselves, right? We want to pass down that person that we hope we will be, that person that we wish we will be. But there's this leadership principle that always comes back to us is that we don't reproduce what we hope to be. We only reproduce what we are. And somewhere in my legacy, somewhere in my history, that Christmas morning without the Super Nintendo, throwing a fit on the ground, kicking and screaming, has made its way over to my son. It's a, it's a moment of shame for me, to be really. We reproduce what we are. But you know what? Something I'm trying to teach my kids, something I'm still trying to learn, is that there are better gifts, under the, better gifts than what can be put under the tree. And so over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the true gifts of Christmas. Two weeks ago, Leonor Ortega Till from Five Iron Frenzy spoke to us about the hope that is found in the most mundane of moments. How even those moments that seem simple can be moments of great hope. And then last week, through the story of Simeon, we talked about the expectation, the generous expectation that God gives us of peace. And this morning, I want to share with you another of the true gifts of Christmas, and that is a legacy of love, a legacy of love. Think for just a moment. If you were to leave a legacy right now, based on where you are in life, what would that legacy look like? Some of you are smiling. Some of you immediately, your face just kind of went, Ugh, for a moment. But I want you to ponder that question as we work through one of the Christmas stories where that legacy of love becomes a central theme. So turn, if you will, in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. You, if you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew in front of you. You're welcome to take that home as our gift. You can also download the Bible app and find it there. The Christmas story is, is most powerfully shown in Luke. We see a lot of it there that we don't see in other Gospels. But what we see before we even get to Jesus in the book of Luke is there's this other family that gets the focus first. And so starting in verse 5, we're going to look at a man by the name of Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. And it says in verse 5, in the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest of Abijah's division named Zechariah, and his wife was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Verse 6, both were righteous in God's sight, living without blame according to all the commands and requirements of the Lord. So let's take a little aside here. Just kind of put your finger there. We'll come right back. Notice what it's saying about these two individuals. It's giving their history. It's giving their pedigree. She is from the lineage of Aaron, who's the brother of Moses, the Aaronic priesthood, all these great things that you're like, wow, what is that? You know, they had that clout, right? And then it says, not just one, but both of them were righteous before God's sight. These were people to look up to. But in verse 7, we see kind of a pivot in their story. We see that moment where the nativity moves from a plastic thing on our mantle to flesh and blood people who are struggling with some of the same things we might struggle with. In verse 7, it says, But they had no children, because Elizabeth could not conceive, and both of them were well along in years. Now, that's just a sentence in the Bible, but that represents years a lifetime of hopes and dreams, a lifetime of pain and sorrow. If you've ever had that moment where you've tried and tried to have a kid and it just hasn't happened, perhaps you can feel what's going on in these two people's lives. This is a struggle for them. And so as the story goes on in verse 8, we see Zechariah is doing his priestly duty. And it happens that he's chosen by lot to go in, as was the custom, and burn incense in the sanctuary of the Lord. So picking up in verse 10, it says, At the hour of incense, the whole assembly of the Lord was praying outside. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and overcome with fear. 
as any one of us would be. I mean, he's doing his job, right? Imagine you're, you know, serving tables. You're entering numbers into a computer. You're, you're doing whatever you do Monday through Saturday, 9 to 5 or 9 to 9, however long you're there, and you look up, and there's an angel. I think his response was a little bit appropriate, right? He kind of looks up and goes, okay, something's different right now. And immediately from this, the angel says, don't be afraid, but look at what he says next. Your prayers have been heard. Those long years of doubt, those long years of struggle, your wife will bear a son and you will name him John. And there will be joy and delight and many will rejoice at this birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will never drink wine or beer and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. He will turn many of the children of Israel to their God and he will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah, turning the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of righteousness, making ready for the Lord a prepared people." Now, if you're Zechariah in this moment, you probably have a very human set of thoughts going through your head, right? Mr. Angel, sir, you don't know the years of struggle we've gone through. Mr. Angel, sir, you don't understand what has happened in our lives. We've been down this road. We've tried. We've gotten our hopes up before. So you better not be selling me a bill of goods here, right? And so what does he say? How can I know this. Now, even the words themselves betray a little bit of doubt that comes from that pain. You'll see next, in two weeks when we look at Mary, she says, wow, how can this be? I'm a virgin. This is going to be an interesting thing to behold. Zechariah says, whoa, 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 whoa. How can I be sure about this? And then look what he adds. He says, I'm an old man and, and my wife, please don't tell her I said this. She's well along in her years. Let's just go with the diplomatic option here, guys. I mean, he's got every reason to doubt, right? It's a human response born out of his pain. But the angel looks at him and says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I was sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. Now listen, you will become silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe me. But my words will be fulfilled at the proper time. Now, I resonate with some of the things he says in there because I, I live up here a lot of times, right? If it makes sense up here, I'm good with it. If it doesn't make sense up here, I'm like, yeah, right, prove it to me. And that's kind of where Zechariah is living right now. But he has some reasons he and his wife, as he points out, are advanced in years. But yet, he should have remembered, he should have felt something stir in him, a story from his own past, from his own faith history. In fact, one we talked about not that long ago, where Sarah and Abraham, who are around 100 years old, are told a very similar thing. And Sarah's response is much less diplomatic. She looks at God and she goes, have you seen my husband? He's old. Zechariah at least was like, you know, she's advanced in years. Let's just put it that way. He should have resonated with this because this was a story that was passed down and they are in the priestly lineage. They, they should know that God has come through in this way before. And yet he doubts. And so he sees the consequences on it. How can this possibly be. Remember what we've been talking about over the last few weeks that this whole life journey, it's about the heart, right? And he's doubting in his heart. And he really doubts God. And you know what? I'd never made this connection before this week as I was preparing. But as we look at the legacy that Zechariah leaves through John the Baptist. I want to fast forward just a moment and skip ahead because near the end of John the Baptist's life, the man who not only baptized Jesus to begin his public ministry, but proclaimed him as the Messiah, all of a sudden is sending a messenger who says, hey, hey Jesus, j just to make sure, are you the Messiah or should we be looking for someone else? That thread of doubt 
that began with Zechariah. Maybe Zechariah inherited it. It got passed on to John the Baptist. So now the Christmas story skips around a little bit. We see Mary and and the announcement to her. We see Elizabeth and Mary meeting as as the pregnancies are, are in motion. But skip ahead to verse 57. Verse 57 in Luke chapter 1. It says, Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she had a son. Then her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her this great mercy, and they rejoiced with her. Verse 59, when they came to circumcise the child on the eighth day, they were going to name him Zechariah. Let me just pause right there for a moment. They are going to name him Zechariah. Zechariah, the father, has been mute. He's not able to speak. But in that day, in that custom, it was the male father, the the progenitor's responsibility to name the children. And so they, this group of outside people who are very close, you know, friends, family, they decide that we will go ahead and do what's best for your family, right? And so we're going to name your kid Zechariah. Let me just tell you something real quick as an aside. The main thought today is the legacy of love that we leave. But a side note in this story is that other people will always think they know what's best for your life, right? Other people will always say, look, here is what, we're going to honor you by doing this. But if you have heard from God, if you know from him what is right, you can't let them tell you what to do and where to go. And in this moment, they are going to take the reins. And Elizabeth says, whoa, 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 hold on, wait a second. His name's supposed to be John. Now, Zechariah has been mute So somehow he communicated this over to her. This has become a part of her story. She understands it, but she's about to get trumped by them. So they look at the father and they say, Zechariah, what do you say? And he writes on a tablet, his name is John. I want you to realize when he did that, he was saying, look, I could have had my legacy He could have been Zech Jr. Isn't that just roll right off the tongue? He could have have allowed him to be named after himself and take up that inheritance. But instead, he said, no, no. God said his name would be John. So that's what we're going with. I choose to honor God. This story reminds me of a moment in our lives, my wife and I, that, that resonates very similarly. You see... As I've shared with you before, my father wasn't a part of a a large portion of my life. And so at one point, we were married, but we hadn't had kids yet. And we came to this decision moment where I had started having a conversation with, with my wife about, what if we rename our family? We're Brown. I'm Ernest Lee Brown Jr. That's my name. I am named after my father. I am the second version of him according to the, the naming culture but I didn't have a relationship with my father. And on the other side, my grandfather, who is a Wells, Gerald Eugene Wells, his only male child has had only daughters. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but when the daughter gets married, typically that name goes away. And so my grandfather's name, Wells, is is potentially going to disappear in that sense. And so for a a long season, we wrestled with this, where I was going to rename myself Lee Wells. My wife, who had just changed her name not that long ago, was going to become Renee Wells. And then our future children would be Wells as well. But God has a sense of humor, right? And he said, why don't we bring your father back into the picture? And so my father came back into the picture right as we're having this conversation. And out of honor, I went to him and I said, Dad, here's the conversation we're having. And he looked at me and he said, Son, I I don't have the right to speak into this anymore. I've lost that right. But you are Ernest Lee Brown Jr. You are my namesake. And I would prefer, I can't demand, but I would prefer that you continue with that name. And so I had this wrestling moment to say, you know, do I honor my grandfather? Do I honor my father? What would be the best thing for us? And so we came up with a little system for for our family. My son is named Logan, and despite popular opinion, he's not named after Wolverine. That's, That's only a part of why we named him that. That's not the whole reason. 
But his name is Logan Eugene, after my grandfather, Wells Brown. And so now he carries with him that Wells name. He will always be a Brown, but our hope is that should we have any more children, they will be Wells Browns. And then as we look at Jaslyn's life, we're, we're getting closer and closer to where we're going to adopt her. And her name is going to be changed from her family name to the Brown name. But we thought, wouldn't it be honoring if while we have Logan Eugene Wells Brown, we would have Jaslyn, we're still debating on the middle name, Riggle Brown. Because Riggle is her tribe. That's her parents. Because we want to honor the legacy of our past in any ways that we can through that. So let me ask you again, what is the legacy that you would leave behind were your life to be right where it is, right in this moment? Because that is what Zechariah had a choice in that moment. He could have chosen to live a selfish life and say, yes, he will be Zech Jr. He will take after me in every way. But instead he said, I will put God's heart in front of my own rights as a father. And let me just say this, that proved who he centered his life around. And in your life, if, if your legacy is the center of your life, if your children are the center of your life, if the country, your family, your wealth, your whatever, if it's not Jesus at the center of your life, those things are idols. And he proved he put nothing else before God by saying his name is John. And he left a legacy of love. Verse 66 says, all who heard him took it to heart. Notice how that word keeps showing up in our, our scriptures as we read them. And they said, what then will this child become? For indeed, the Lord's hand was upon him. And what was the motto of John's life? What was the legacy that John the Baptist left behind? But that he was the forerunner to Jesus. He even said, I must decrease so that he can increase. So Zechariah left behind a legacy of love. And that is a powerful legacy. Today, we are putting a, a day on the calendar. You know, our early documents simply say in the winter of 1887 to 1888. We know our first services were held in 1888, but the, the planning stages, the, the process was begun in 1887. And so sometime around now, we are celebrating 130 years of continuous ministry here in Denver. That is a fantastic legacy. But like Zechariah and Elizabeth, that also means... We are well advanced in years, right? Can we just say it that way? I don't think any of us was here at the, the dawning of, of this movement called Sloan's Lake. I don't think any of us is 130. Again, Loyal's 103, so he's the closest out of us. But, but that is a long stretch, is it not? And many churches in that time find that that's around the days where they're closing their doors, where they're having their final services, where we've entrenched things so much, where we refuse to change with the times that we are now that old church in the old part of town that was once a beacon of hope for others. But that is not the legacy that Sloan's Lake has in this season of life, we have been deciding whether or not we are going to put aside our personal preferences, whether or not we're going to put aside what things have made us feel at home in order to see a new day and a new birth and a new season in this new world we find ourselves facing. And I am proud to say that is the legacy that I see in this church. In fact, I keep saying it, but I am so blessed by the legacy that I have been left, that I have inherited as your pastor. You know, my predecessor, Ed Nelson, made sure that he told everyone, here's what needs to happen in this next day. God is going to do a brand new thing. Now, it's one thing to say that. It's another thing to stand behind it. Because I've seen transitions between pastors where the previous pastor starts to th see things change and goes, hold on a second, you're undoing everything I just did. 
That has not been Pastor Ed. In fact, I talked to him just this last week asking if he was going to be able to make it here today. And he said, Lee, I continue to be your biggest cheerleader, but my pastor in Fort Collins needs me. He said, Lee, that church is trying to do many of the things that you guys have already been able to accomplish in your short time. And he is meeting resistance. And so I need to be there with him so that the congregation sees that it's time for a new day and that someone who has sat in my seat is fully in support of that pastor. And I just said, wow, that is a move of integrity. That is a legacy that I hope to continue. And then as I was getting ready for this week, I remembered that towards the beginning of my time here, I was listening to some of the past sermons And I came across Pastor Ed's final sermon that he delivered as our senior pastor, because you know he was back a few weeks ago. And this is what he said near the end of his final sermon as our pastor. I know there's doubts and there's questions. I've heard even some people say things like, well, now that that Pastor Ed and Sherry are gone, this place is going to fall apart. You know the Hebrew for that? Hogwash. Yeah, yeah, that's what that is. And it would be easy for us in this times of transitions, because transitions get kind of messy sometimes. It'd be easy for us, like little Jennifer when she was three, to crawl into our little hole and, and get on with the business of surviving. Oh, church, don't do that. Don't do that. When and if Pastor Lee comes, give him your full support. He's 35. He will have the craziest ideas. He'll sound like he's nuts to you, I'm sure. (laughs) But give him your prayers and your hopes and give him your best and give him your energy. And remember this, you're not grasshoppers. You are children of God children of a promise and if you do that the best days will be before you so i say to you one more time one last time no grasshopper complex please you didn't know ed was a prophet did you he's gonna have crazy ideas he was speaking that into our congregation right before i got here right But for a man like that, to to leave that legacy, to say, I've been here 17 years, but it's time for a new day. And then to stand behind it by saying, you know what? I could be here in the church I so dearly love because believe me, as I listened to the tone in his voice, he was struggling with the fact that he could be here. He could be here and celebrate our 130th together. But he said, where I am most needed right now is to be in Fort Collins supporting my pastor there. And so that is a legacy of love that, we le- that he has left behind and that I have so graciously inherited. What will be the legacy that you leave behind? Maybe you're not at that stage in life yet. Maybe you're thinking, whoa, hold on, wait a second. It's way too early to be thinking about legacies, right? Well, let me just tell you, if you're not thinking about it now, wherever you are in life, you're not going to be ready for it then. And so you curate, you hold, you steward that legacy that God has given you, that you will pass down to your children and your children's children. We as a church also have a legacy. We are 130 years old, but you know why I played that clip? It wasn't because he called me out and said I was crazy before he even knew me. It was, it was because he said something that's been on my heart for the last several months. He said, the best is yet to come. And I believe that our legacy is not done yet. I believe that as we look back from the year 150 uh, in our legacy, that we will have seen God do even greater things than we could have asked for or imagined as we sit at year 130. Doesn't mean it's not going to be hard. Doesn't mean there's not going to be moments where we go, what are you doing, God? But I believe that this church is going to have an even greater impact and an even greater legacy Because I believe that God is ready to reclaim what hell is stolen in this city. God is ready to reclaim lost lives and give them a place to find hope. More than that, a people 
who bear and bring hope everywhere they go. And so today as we prepare to celebrate 130 years, we are not celebrating or talking about the deceased as we do at a funeral. We are talking about something that is more alive now than we could have imagined. Not because I'm here, not because the transition has happened, but because God is doing something powerful. And Pastor Ed, Pastor Alan, Pastor Gordon spoke into this season and prepared the way so that we could have a brand new season and a brand new day. I am so thankful for that because I believe our legacy is only brighter from here. I believe that we have more to give in this city than we have ever known before. And I believe that God is ready to do something powerful through us. But as I've shared before, I believe that starts with us coming together And I don't know how God keeps doing this. I promise I'm not looking at the calendar and going, oh, it's communion, so here's the type of message we have to to speak. It just kind of happens this way. God has a greater plan this way. But in just a moment, we're going to take communion together. And as we do, in the English, communion means common union. It means a coming together. It means a, a binding of unity. But in the Greek, it means thankfulness, the Thanksgiving meal. And so we are coming together with thankfulness in our hearts for what God is going to do. So the ushers are going to come forward. They're going to hand out the elements. What I would ask you to do is to keep those ready as we will take them together after we continue on in worship. But as you have those elements, as you're thinking about these questions, think about what your legacy in your own life will look like and pray for the legacy that Sloan's Lake will continue to give, continue to have. Allow me to pray for us together. Heavenly Father, God, I am so thankful for what you are doing in our midst. I'm thankful that you are ready to leave a legacy of love through each and every one of us, that as we look at our lives, we are deciding each day what we are going to pass on to our children and our grandchildren. God, we know that we're not going to pass down what we want to be, but who we truly are. So we pray that each and every day we would be becoming more like you. And today on this special occasion, we pray for this church. We pray for this body of believers who has stretched across 130 years, 13 decades, and who now sits here as Sloan's Lake Church. God, may our impact in Denver over the next 20 or 30 years, over the next 130 years, be even greater than what we have seen in the past. Not because we want to build up our legacy, but because we must decrease so that you can increase in our hearts, in our city, and throughout the world. Jesus, we give this moment over to you and we turn our hearts back to reflect on you. Amen.